Amen and amen. Good evening, everybody. Now, today we're going to kind of continue. Um, I wanted to I wanted to bring out some important parts to what we've been discussing, especially relating to the power of praise and thanksgiving and worship when it comes to getting answers to prayer. So we started it last week, Tuesday. We touched a bit on it in Sunday service, brought an aspect of it in Sunday service. So uh, let's know God meetings like today. These are meetings where we now have the opportunity to ask questions, break it down, look at all the dimensions of it. We don't have that kind of um, structure for Sunday services. So there is something I would like to bring out that I found very interesting as I was studying it. And I'm just going to quickly share my screen back again. And then we discuss and look at the word of God relating to the dynamics of faith and how it was expressed in the Bible. So today we're going to look at what I call some faith dynamics. And I'll start with reading scripture. We'll go back to our anchor scripture, which we used last week, let's know God, and on, on Sunday as well, in Sunday service, because I want to build on what we've learned so far and add something extra to it, just to help us to understand how God operates, especially as regards getting results in our lives and moving us forward. So our uh, anchor scripture from last week, Let's Know God, as well as this Sunday service, was from Second Chronicles chapter 20, from verse 1 to 30. Now, I'm aware that not everybody came to Sunday service, so I'm going to start reading the scripture from beginning again and explain a couple of things. So even if you weren't in Sunday service, you will still be blessed by the grace of God. Remember, this is a Discovery Bible study meeting. So once we are done with the teachings and the Bible readings, you're free to ask questions. You're free to also share your revelations and insights regarding what we have studied today. So without wasting time, Second Chronicles chapter 20 from verse 1. I read, it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazo, Hazazom Tama, which is in Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction. Then thou wilt hear and help. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children, 
Then upon Jahazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus said the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand still, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Kohites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness. As they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endure forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And there were three days in the gathering of spoil. It was so much. So this is the first scripture I will read. I'm, going, I'm trying to bring out something that I've seen as a pattern which we should learn and adopt. So when I'm done reading these different scriptural references, you will see how they all connect together in terms of the principles that we are operated in order to get dynamic divine results. So let's look at another story, Paul and Silas in prison. We all know this story. Acts chapter 16 from verse 16 to 34. You will see the story there if you read from verse 16 to 34, but I'm just going to take verse 25 to 26. But before I read it, I just want to give a little context. Paul and Silas were beaten by the Roman army and they were put in a dungeon. So when Romans beat you, when Roman soldiers beat you, they really beat you. They were known for being quite good at wickedness. So the state Paul and Silas were at this time in the prison was a state of pain because their backs were beaten, their bodies were in pain. Yet, Acts chapter 16, verse 25 to 26 said, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, number one, and sang praises unto the Lord, number two. And the prisoners heard them. So what they were doing was not quiet. They were not just praying quietly or singing quietly unto themselves. They prayed out loud and they sang praises unto the Lord, unto God. And the Bible recorded that the prisoners heard them. Then, watch what happened next. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Take note of this. Another scripture. When Jesus cleansed the ten lepers, and one returned to give him praise. Luke chapter 17, verse 15 through 16. Now, from verse 11, let's start from verse 11. 
And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So this is like prayer. They lifted up their voices to Christ, asking for something. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. So it's interesting, you notice here, that Jesus made an important point, that giving praise, thanksgiving, glory, worship is important to God. And it brings something extra beyond what you get ordinarily in a prayer session. So prayer is valid, but when you add the extra dimension of worship, praise, and thanksgiving, it brings something extra. At this point, for this particular man, he was already healed, but when he returned to thank God and to glorify God and to praise God, and he did it loud, he got what is called wholeness. So in case there were any scars or repercussions on account of the sickness, he was completely healed. All the other nine did not get wholeness. They probably will have to wait for a year or two or three before their bodies fully recover from the debilitating disease of leprosy. But this man got his wholeness instantly. Let's continue. Solomon's dedication of the temple, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 through 14. This was after Solomon had built the temple of God and was dedicating him. So see what the Bible said here. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Hmm. Second Kings chapter 3, from verse 15 to through 17. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hands. Just follow me. There's something interesting. I, I created a little chart here. These are just a few scriptures that... I'm sharing. There are many other scriptures that are referencing a similar principle. So I created a chart here, which I hope you all can see. I'm going to describe the chart. What you notice here is this. When prayer comes, people pray. The children of Israel pray. I talked about it on, on Sunday in service. I said, prayer can be going to God to get a prophetic word, to get an instruction. There are three other dimensions I didn't mention in service that I'm mentioning today. Because of time, we didn't have time to go deeper into it in service. So in actual sense, when you pray, five things generally are what you get as an expectation. I mentioned the prophetic word or a prophetic instruction. So like I said on Sunday, 
when you get a prophetic word, it's like God has given you an assurance. You can now take that word and run with it. God says, I promise I'll give you this, I'll do this and that. You can take that word, get into thanksgiving, get into action, run with it, and you see the manifestation. Because God's word is like a check. You can take it to any bank and cash it. Once God has said it over you, it is as good as settled. Your job is to work it out. Cash that check. Take the necessary actions and get the required results. It can also be an instruction. So, for example, God can give you his word and say, this is your season of abundance, you're blessed. God can also give you an instruction. Wake up and call so so and so person or go to so 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 and so place. You're going to get the answer to your prayer. Either one comes at the time of prayer. Sometimes after you've prayed, you get the prophetic word or you get an instruction. There are three other sides or three other things you can also get, which I'm going to mention. But you notice something. In some cases, prayer gets the prophetic word. Like when we read Jehoshaphat, the story of Jehoshaphat, they entered prayer and fasting, went to the temple and sought the Lord. Then the hand of the Lord came upon somebody, a prophet, and that was God's word. He released it and said, you guys don't need to fight in this battle. The battle is the Lord's. On some other occasions, you may get a prophetic word, like Naaman came and met the prophet. And the prophet said, go and wash your eyes. I mean, go and wash yourself seven times inside a river. When you come out, your leprosy will be gone. That was an instruction. And the result came as Naaman obeyed the instruction. But there also is another dimension that is called signs. When you're praying and seeking God's face, signs can also come. What are signs? Those are the dimensions where you have dreams. Sometimes you have dreams. Sometimes you have visions. Sometimes you have a, a signal inside of your spirit about something coming or about something that is already done or about a door that has opened. Sometimes it may be a dream. You may dream and in your dream, you see somebody handing you, you know, there are sorts of things that different ways dreams can come. Maybe handing you a, a, a mantle or handing you, um, some people say handing you a bag of gold. Um, somebody has said, what well, they dreamt that they saw gold falling down from the ceiling into their house. It can be anything, but those are what? Signs. It's trying to show you what heaven is doing regarding the prayers you've allowed to ascend. There is a fourth thing that also happens in the place of prayer. That is called divine intervention. So there are times you're praying, God goes ahead and, you know, intervenes in the situation, sends an angel, an angel probably goes and does the fight or does something dramatic. It's a divine intervention. So Jesus Christ lifted up the um, um, five loaves and two fishes and blessed it and broke it and shared it to the people. In that process of giving thanks, blessing. So it was like a prayer and thanksgiving. And then he broke the bread and that thing multiplied. That's like a divine intervention. The last one is what I call behind the scenes. And I'm going to explain it further as we go down. So you see, when you start praying, if you also look at the corner, at the process of praying, you can pray and enter praise, worship, and thanksgiving and still get access to the prophetic word, the divine instruction, signs, visions, divine intervention, or a behind-the-scenes move. For the last, um, the, 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 one of the scriptures we read, you see that the prophet said, bring me a minstrel. What he was doing, he wasn't praying to get the hand of God on him. There are other times you pray and the hand of God comes on you. Prophet Elijah climbed up the mountain, prayed. The hand of God came upon him. So by the time he was now announcing that there's an abundance of rain, when he started running, he had to run the king's chariots. So you can pray yourself into a dimension where God's hand rests on you. Jesus Christ prayed himself 
into that dimension where God's hand so rested on him that he walked on water. But you can also praise and worship and thank God into that realm as well. Because that, that heart of praise, that heart of gratitude, that heart of worship, that heart of thanksgiving, if you stay in it long enough, it is also a carrier into the spirit realm. So the, uh, the prophet said, bring me a minstrel. He wasn't praying. He was saying, I need to travel into that realm and get a word from God. So the moment the minstrel started playing, the minstrel is a, is a psalm, is somebody who knows how to play worship music or with, with the string instrument most of the time. Sometimes it can be somebody who knows how to sing or worship. And as they are doing it, the portal of heaven opens and you collect a divine word or an assurance or a promise from God that you can run with. So you have prophetic words, instructions, signs, divine intervention. You can pray even without seeing a sign, without getting an instruction, without getting a prophetic word, God goes ahead and does, does something. Then there is a behind the scenes, which I'll take time to explain as we go further. Now, when you get any of these things, the next step is either you take action. Most of the time, you get a prophetic word or an instruction. You take action on it. Or you get a sign. You take action on it. Maybe you dream about something. You either take action of, of if it's a negative thing, counseling it in prayer. If it is positive, receiving it in prayer and thanking God for it. So some of these processes distill into taking an action at the end of the day. But there is also the part of making that same praise, worship, and thanksgiving that can give you access into the spirit realm, a kind of sandwich. You don't just run off to act on the prophetic word. In your acting, put praise, worship, and thanksgiving inside of it because the mystery about praise the mystery about worship and thanksgiving is that it glorifies God directly. And it is really the thing that God receives from us. Every other thing is what God gives to us. But what God receives from us is our appreciation, our glorifying him, our thanking him, our praise. And that particular process or that particular activity, God himself comes to inhabit it. So Jehoshaphat was smart. He completed the whole circuit. He went in prayer, added even fasting. So in case that, you know, when they, Jesus Christ mentioned in the Bible, when they were casting out, when he was casting out the demon, he said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So because the situation Jehoshaphat faced was so dramatic, a lot of people were all afraid. The whole country was afraid because an army that was much larger than them in multitude was coming to destroy them. He entered prayer and fasting with everybody in the land. So as they were fasting, they went into the temple of God and started the prayer session. In prayer, the hand of God came on a prophet and the prophetic word was given. That prophetic word was, the battle is the Lord's. You don't need to fight. Go and meet them in battle. You won't fight them. God will fight the battle. Beautiful. They took up that prophetic word. And that prophetic word also came with an act one instruction because the prophetic word was that this battle is the Lord's. Then the action was that go, go to the battle and set yourself in array. Then you will now see what God will do. So Jehoshaphat and the army went, but he understood the principle that God inhabits the praises, the worship and the thanksgiving of his people. God comes when you praise and thank him. When you pray, God can send an angel or a couple of angels. He won't come himself because prayer is you asking God for something. But when you praise God and when you thank God and when you worship him, it is the only thing that he alone receives. He comes to collect it himself. So Jehoshaphat understood this. So he did the master stroke and he told himself, I have received the prophetic word, which is as good as a Check that is cashable because if God says it, it is as good as done. As far as God has said it, it is sealed and delivered. It is certain to happen. But he didn't stop there. He took that word and still set praise singers and worshippers in front of the army. Why? 
He wanted the same God that gave the word to come down and join them into the battle. That was a principle also Moses kind of understood. But I'm talking about now the principle of his presence. Moses understood that principle. So there was a time Moses was interceding for the children of Israel because God was angry with them. And God said, okay, I've heard you. I will delegate an angel to follow you guys and take you to the promised land. Moses said, no, I'm not going. If you, God, don't come yourself to lead us like you have been leading us, I'm not standing from here. Moses knew the difference between the Oga coming and a boy being sent. He knew the difference between the king of kings coming himself versus an angel being delegated. So he said, Lord, I'm not going to stand up if you don't come. Jehoshaphat understood that God comes whenever we praise and we thank and we worship him. So even after God had given him the assurance with the prophetic word and also given him this instruction, he wanted to make assurance double sure. And he started praising and thanking God and set praise singers ahead in front of the army to go before them so that God can come. And they kept singing, for the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. And they entered that battle and they saw amazing results. I noticed that no matter what you're praying for, if you can extend the time you also thank and praise God, you will get more interesting results. That's what I noticed in the Bible. And you can do your own research yourself. We are used to praying and, you know, jamming the gates of heaven and crying out to God. And that is very good. And that is very valid. All I'm trying to say is let us add the extra dimension of praising, worshiping, and thanking God as long as the time we spend also praying, if possible. Because what we typically do with praise and thanksgiving is we do prayers and then we do praise 10 minutes or 7 minutes, um, worship another 10 minutes or so. And then maybe by the time the atmosphere is getting a little bit charged and God is descending, we cut the worship and start preaching. Even in our own personal devotion, sometimes we may just start worshiping God and praising God as a prelude to prayer. So in our mind, prayer is the main thing. Let's just do worship and thank God before we start praying. So we start our own personal prayer sessions with, oh God, we thank you. We thank you for today. Thank you for keeping us alive. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for making us to be strong. Oh, thank you, Lord. Then you take off in prayer. So your thanksgiving and your praise and worship was probably a five-minute session. It was just a prelude to a prayer that you now extend long. Now I'm trying to say that there's something in prayer, I mean in praise and in worship and thanksgiving. Prayer is very important, but praise, worship, and thanksgiving is also very important. I read David's life. David was one warrior that fought battles and died peacefully. I was thinking they said in the Bible, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. He didn't die by any sword. He died peacefully. This guy, the Bible recorded that morning, afternoon, and evening, he, he prays to God. Same Bible records seven times in a day. The same David goes to the temple to worship and praise God. So he did more praise and worship than praying. I'm not trying to say that you should do more praise and worship. I'm only trying to show you from Bible that there's something about praising, thanking, and worshiping God that makes God relocate from heaven and come where you are. Just imagine the context of Paul and Silas. These were men that Roman soldiers beat. So it's not the time to be thanking God. It's not the time to be praising God. Their bodies are paining them. Their backs are bloodied. And you know, if they've ever flogged you before, they flogged me in my secondary school, your shirt can, once they flog you and you get wounded, your shirt can stick to the wound. The blood clots and causes the shirt to stick to the wound such that if you want to now remove the shirt, it will be like you're opening another wound again. You can imagine what was in, what, how, what was the state of mind of Paul and Silas at that time? They were in pain. 
but they understood the principle. That even as they're asking God in prayer for divine intervention, they better sandwich it inside praise and worship to bring God himself down because God inhabits the praises of his people. When you add praise, worship and thanksgiving to your prayers, you get more interesting results. Take note of that. What I'm now telling you guys to do is to try and make your praise and your worship and your thanksgiving as long in time duration as you're praying. If you pray for an hour, try and praise for an hour as well. Try and worship for an hour as well. If you try this thing, you, you will think it's easy until you try it. If it hasn't built into you, you may not be able to do it well. And remember, praise and worship is not just song. You can praise and worship and glorify God talking. When I say, Father, I thank you. There is no one like you. Thank you for all the mind-blowing things you've been doing in my life. Thank you for making a way where there is no way. Without you, I could not have made it. Father, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for the interventions that you've been doing. There are ones I can still remember. There are some that I don't even know. But the mere fact that I am here is all because of your grace. I cannot thank you enough. That is thanksgiving. That is praise. And that is worship. You don't need to sing. But if you want to sing, sing. If you even want to play music in your ear and sing along with it, do it, but extend the time because it always gives more interesting results. So I have talked about the first one you get in that interaction of prayer, sandwich with praise, worship, and thanksgiving, or sometimes the praise and worship and thanksgiving alone where you ask a minstrel to play gets the prophetic word on you or divine instruction on you. Or if you're like now, we are all in a season of prayer. Sometimes you sleep, you have dreams. So those dreams can be signs. They can be announcements. Sometimes you may have visions. Sometimes you may be asking God for something. You don't know how it's going to be. Something is happening in your office and you need God's intervention. He doesn't give you a prophetic word. He doesn't give an instruction, but you get to the office. You see, he has already gone ahead and fought the battle. That's divine intervention. The fourth one, rather the fifth one, which I call behind the scenes, is what I now want to explain as I start rounding up. These are the dynamics of what we are doing in Christendom. As we seek God's face, as we pray, as we get deeper in God, these are the dynamics of how things happen. Now, what do I call behind the scenes work? This behind the scene makes up 80 to 90% of our Christian existence. And let me explain. If you're praying, because there's a way you, you understand these teachings from last week into the Sunday service into today, there's a way you look at these teachings and you will tell yourself, anytime I'm praying, if I don't receive a prophetic word from God, I have not prayed. No, I didn't say that. Don't come and say, anytime I'm praying and I don't receive a divine instruction, maybe God has not heard me. I didn't say that. Kenneth Hagin said something. He said 80 to 90% of the breakthroughs and experiences he has had in his life came from behind the scenes work. He didn't get a prophetic word. He didn't get a divine instruction. He just found God moving him into a place of rest and a place of blessing, even many times without his knowledge or his understanding. He said that it's later when he arrives there that he begins to understand what God was doing. That is what the behind the scenes work means. As far as you're in a spiritual state, you're, you're somebody who is praying. You're somebody who is serving in the house of God. You're somebody who has a relationship with God. You have a good, you have prayer times, you have worship times, you have your Bible study times. As far as your spirit man is active, your spirit is on point. You don't need to be praying for 50 hours, no, but you just have to be that consistent person that does your daily morning devotion or evening devotion and Bible study. Your spirit man is alive. As far as your spirit is alive, God is working. The Holy Spirit is always working. You may not notice it, but he's working. He may not be loud or make an announcement, but he's working. He may not give you a prophetic word, but he's still working. He may not give an instruction, but he's still working. 
It may not be a dramatic divine intervention like the one he did with Jehoshaphat, where he killed all the soldiers that were against the Israelites without them fighting any war. It may not be that, but he is still working. The moment you lift up your mouth and start praying, praying in your own normal language, you understand, and praying in tongues especially, you're activating the workings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit starts praying as well through you, bringing to pass great things about your life and destiny you don't even know. The moment you lift up your voice in worship and praising God, God comes. And as he comes, the Bible said, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. What it means is that the moment he comes, anything that is not working in your life, he starts getting them to work. You may not see it. You may not hear a loud sound, but you just find out that after a powerful praise and worship session, you go out into the day, unusual breakthroughs and blessings start happening. That behind the scenes work is what he majorly does. All the other ones, he also majorly does them as well, but your life is not calibrated on all those other ones alone. Everything that you do in God has something that he does for you. And most of the time, you may not recognize it. I show you some scriptures. Let's look at, um, maybe let's look at the first biblical character. Okay, let me read this scripture. This scripture says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is still working. That you did not hear, thus says the Lord, you shall fly to the moon. That you didn't hear, it doesn't mean God is not working. He's still working. God works in dynamic ways. This behind-the-scenes work is so dynamic that sometimes you're praying to God about something and you just sit down to have lunch. And while you're having lunch, somebody starts talking about something and the person makes a mention of something you have been looking for in prayer without even knowing it. And you turn and you look at the person and you say, well, how did this person know? Or how did this person get the answer? And when you're looking at the person, you find out that the person is talking to a friend. But the Holy Spirit used that person to speak to you and you heard it. There are times you may be, you know, you're seeking, what do I do? How do I? What do I? And you probably just, you're browsing on the internet and you just see an idea. And the idea comes alive to you. you it seems as if God picked up that idea and amplified it in your mind. And you tell yourself, it looks like this is something divine. I should explore it. And as you're exploring it, you're getting stronger and stronger convictions inside you that this is the way to go. God also talks like that. That's a behind the scene walk. It doesn't have to be the prophetic or the one we all know. It can be dynamic in numerous ways, but still effective, even if it is not loud, even if it is not heard or seen. An example, David and Goliath, the story we all know. Let's read it and then I'll explain. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 33 to 37. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Then see David's reply. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him. And delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hands of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Why am I using the scripture? See the point here. When David was fighting the lion and the bear, he did not have an idea or a clue that that capacity building was orchestrated by God to prepare him for Goliath. If David had not successfully taken out the lion and the bear, he wouldn't have had the faith to confront Goliath. So there are some challenges you're going through now and you're asking yourself, where is God? You don't know what God is preparing you for. It's when you now get to that higher level that you begin to understand. That is a behind the scenes walk. He doesn't need to explain it to you. He doesn't make it a prophetic word. He doesn't do drama about it. But by the time you pass through that process, you become a prince of power with God. That is a behind-the-scenes walk. 
So nothing about your life, especially if you've been a prayerful person, serving God, worshiping God, having consistent fellowship with God. Nothing about your life is by accident, really. It may look like it's by accident, but God gave us something in the Bible. He said, all things, all, are working out for your good. Whether they seem good or they seem bad or they seem ugly, all of it ultimately works out for your good. So certain experiences you have that may not be so nice are actually maturing experiences, learning experiences, strategic training for a greater glory ahead. I give you another scripture, Joseph and his journey to Egypt. Let's look at Joseph, um, Genesis chapter 45 from verse 4 through 8. At this time, Joseph had now become um, a, the prince in Egypt. And uh, he had now become the top person be, beside Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh handed over every other thing to him. So see what Joseph was telling his brethren when he finally revealed himself to his brethren. Genesis chapter 45, verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold in, into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years had the farmer been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Are you seeing what, what's going on here? Who can imagine from the story and how Joseph, the experience he had. Remember, they had planned to kill him because they were jealous of him. But one of the brothers said, don't kill this guy. Let's keep him in a pit. Then while they were still doing all that, they now decided somehow or the other, there are some slave masters coming. Let's sell this guy and make some money. And they sold the guy. And this guy was sold as a slave. And landed Potiphar's house. And in Potiphar's house, because the wife of Potiphar wanted him and he didn't want to defile himself, he got put in a dungeon. A dungeon is not the same thing as a prison. A dungeon is where you don't see light. A dungeon is underground. They put him in a dungeon. And he was in that dungeon two years for something he did not do. Who can tell that in all that, that it is God that was orchestrating it? In that bitter experience, in that difficult experience, it was the only route that God could use to send this man to the throne in Egypt. It was the only route. So God orchestrated the slaves to come and pick him up before these brothers decide to ultimately kill him. They were still debating it. The slaves came and God put it in their mind. Let's sell this guy. That was expressway ticket to Egypt. He gets to Egypt and happens to be bought by Potiphar. Potiphar is the guy, is the captain of the king's guard. So Potiphar act, had access to the king's own special prison. So it's in the king's own special prison that Joseph was now put because God had already organized it that the butler who was the king's cup bearer, will meet with Joseph in that place. Any other prison, the butler won't be there because the butler is the king's cup bearer. So the butler will be in the king's own prison. If they had gone to, in fact, if another man, maybe one Philippine, um, what do I call his name? Maybe one Philippi or one um, Jacob, or I mean, whatever name, instead of Potiphar, had bought Joseph, Joseph would not have access to that situation which would have brought him into the prison of the king. But Potiphar specifically buys this guy and then sends him to the prison. In that prison, the butler is networked with Joseph. And the butler sees that Joseph, the cup bearer, the cup bearer of the king, sees that Joseph has the gift of interpretation of dreams. And then now, God now touches the mind of the king and the king has a series of dreams back to back. And he's so troubled. And the cupbearer remembers Joseph. 
So Joseph did not know. I'm telling you, when this when the slave master tied him with chains and beat him up and carried him to sell, there's nobody that would have that can convince me that he knew he would ultimately be the king in, 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 in Egypt. He would ultimately be on top. He, that route, nobody understood it. That route did not seem nice. But I just want to tell you, every unjust suffering or difficulty is redemptive in nature. There is a greater glory that is ahead. Just stand to be blessed. Stay with God. Keep following the principles. Don't bother what other people are saying. People will come and be looking at you and telling you it doesn't seem like you know what you're doing. The only thing you know is God. What, what, what result do you have to show for it? Don't worry about what they're saying. As far as you are with God, consistent in your devotion, there is a behind-the-scenes work that God does. You may not understand it or see it clearly as it is, but all of a sudden you find yourself in a large place. And then you start remembering past days of struggle, past days of of trying to learn something, trying to build yourself in an area, past days of certain sacrifices and debts you went in prayer and it seemed as if heaven was not responding. Your capacity was being built and all that time the prayer was ascending. When the rain now starts falling, you see yourself in such a large place and you will say, oh, Lord, you passed me through this for me to be able to handle the new level that you have brought to me. So Joseph said, God sent me before you. It's not you people that sold me. You people just, you people sold me in your head, but it was God that sent me ahead to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So let's keep praying and adding praise, worship, thanksgiving to our prayers. Listen to the prophetic word. Pick instructions, prophetic instructions or divine instructions. Listen or check out for signs as they come. Act immediately. We get any instructions that we need to act on. And even in the action, keep praising, keep worshiping, and keep thanking God. Okay, I stop here. Any comments or inputs regarding this or any questions regarding this? I hope it made sense and you have been blessed if you have any comments, any questions, any further inputs, even any testimonies, you can do well to unmute your mic and ask, share, or exhort, as the case may be. The floor is open. Now, that's the challenge with teaching. When you teach and teach and teach, everybody doesn't know. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk again. People, people are more comfortable with staying and hearing and hearing. <laughs> but I think in the participatory part of it, you also enrich your own experience. Okay, Pastor, you thank you for being the pioneer today. All right, unmute yourself and ask or share. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Okay, P, uh, there's something I just want to point out based on what you say, uh, that with praise, God come himself. He doesn't delegate this duty. Now, because I watched the life of David, and if through, throughout the Bible, at least from the best of my understanding, if you see when David prays, say when David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, I didn't see any, any intermediate like um, uh, uh, an angel. God mm -hmm. sent like he's, he's sending in terms of Daniel. Okay, uh, God did, has delegated duty to angels. Not uh, so. It shows that, like what you were saying, that praise itself invite God to come. Mm -hmm. And if you see the David's life in life throughout, you see most of the time it was he was having a direct communication with God, mm -hmm. which is serves as what as as a proof of being a person who is what whose life is full of praise. Mm -hmm. and watch it so that's what i just I, I i i noticed so i just wanted to share so thank you sir thanks and you can and you can also check it you know that that's what this thing you said is is, is, is exactly it david will have some powerful deliverance from god and write a song <laughs> all these psalms you're seeing he will write a song hmm. That's, he's not just he's not it doesn't just end in praise he will immortalize the praise write a song for god to show you the kind of 
that there, there's a lot in this Bible to learn, actually. There's a lot. I just, I just, uh, my, 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 my own personal decision is as I learn, I practice. As I learn, I practice. As I, I, I just have to, because it's in the practice of it that you, that you really know it. Because many times I found out that knowledge and um, understanding are different. Then understanding and wisdom are also different. Knowledge, you just heard the information. That you heard it doesn't mean you understand it. That you heard it doesn't mean you know it. You just heard it. Is at the point of now meditating on it that understanding comes. Then at the point of now acting on what you have meditated and digested and learned, that's when wisdom comes. That's when if anybody is not asking you, nobody can convince you otherwise. You have a revelation, a personal revelation of it. So I hear I act. Is I hear I, the moment you're getting it, anything you're learning, don't just be a hearer. You have itchy ears. You don't know it. Same thing when we study. There are times if you're studying a particular course or certification, as you're studying, the thing is flowing. You're studying, the thing is flowing. Ah, you understand, it's flowing. The thing is moving. You're studying it. All of a sudden, at the end of the chapter you're studying, they give you exercises to test your knowledge. Then you write the exercises and you say, ah, ah, how come I'm not remembering what happened here? Meanwhile, you thought you understood what you were studying. Then you now, you now go back and refer to what you read before in order to be able to understand and solve it. But at this time now, by the time you now solve it, the knowledge you got starts internalizing. You can now begin to say, oh, yes, I've learned this thing. Oh, yes, I understand this thing. So that's how it is. Okay, David, you can unmute yourself. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, thank you, sir, for the teaching. It's a very blessed one. Thank I you. want to say two things. There is an aspect that I would like you to emphasize more on. You just mentioned it briefly, but I feel it's a very important aspect. And uh, it has it helped me sometime in the past. I was while I was on campus. This is a, a testimony. Uh, we were supposed to pay our school fees, and I had actually paid, but the porter had a fault, and uh, I could not print my receipt from February until around June or July. Wow. So, as at the time I was going to print my receipt, the school had made a decision that everybody that did not submit, because we're supposed to submit the receipt together with a particular file to the department, that everyone that did not submit the, their, uh, their school fee receipt with, the, with that file to the department, they are going to pay again wow. that, that money, or they will be made to take that level. I was, a, I, I think I was probably in 300 level. So we're told that we'll be, they will compulsively make us to take that 300 level again. Wow. Or we'll pay that money again. So, and uh, I tried every other means. I looked at what possible, what well, uh, could possibly be done, but there was nothing. But my mind was on God. And I, we have prayed, and I was just expecting. Let's see what is going to happen. But I could not even tell my parents at home because I I can I could not imagine what would be going on in their mind, you know. So, and uh, one fateful afternoon, I sat down with a friend. She was working on the computer. I I was sitting down because we were uh, preparing a, uh, some questions for a particular private school. So we sat down, and as she was typing on the system, there was a song that was she was playing on that on that laptop and while i was listening to the song i caught a word from it and mm -hmm. the word was like god that the, the that god has there is going to be a very simple solution to that thing that i should not just worry that mm -hmm. the the whole situation will be resolved so immediately i caught the word that i called her and i said i i heard something from this word that God is saying he will resolve that problem and he will solve it in a very simple way. And what happened about almost a week later was that some of the lecturers in the school who had children in that same school, you know, 
they are they fell within that same situation and it was like they were sleeping before and within that particular one week all of them just woke up and said ah, we are in this same school together it's the school all of us knew that the school there's a problem with the school portal so why would you say that uh, these people should pay and if these ones are paying that means we also we are going to pay again and we are within that same system so this is not going to be possible that's how mm. the whole situation everything scattered and that's how we got wow. a breakthrough now the the area that i just want you to emphasize on that you mentioned uh, you said something that uh, when we are in the in the mood of the in the spirit mood or something yeah. there's a way you mentioned it that when we are in the spirit mood because there are times yeah. that God is doing some things. You said probably sometime we were seated in, we'll be sitting in, in a place eating and some people mm. are discussing and from what they are saying, we will get what God is saying. Mm. Now, that mood of the spirit is what makes the man not to be carried away, to have mm. caught that thing that God said. Mm. So I just want you to emphasize on that area because I feel it's an important aspect that we need to understand when we worship, when we are afraid, we should not be carried away. We should have this sense that God is doing something and that something is, 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 is in process. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you for that. Very, very powerful testimony and a very good question. Now, remember the key. The key here is to be in the spirit, to be in the mode of the spirit. You have to be in a, you have to be in a place where your Christian life is on point. You're not in sin. And your daily devotion is consistent. So your spiritual antenna is well-tuned. In that state, like I said, God is very dynamic. God can speak to you in one way. Don't think it's the only way he talks. He can change it. God can reveal things to you in one pattern. That's not the only way he does. He can reveal it to you, yes, but he can also change the way he reveals things to you especially when he wants to upgrade your spiritual awareness so that you don't get locked in a pattern and say, this is how God talks to me. No, God can talk in a variety of ways. The key is that your fellowship with the Holy Spirit has to be consistent on a daily basis. You have to at least have a routine and a discipline of always tuning in to God every day, tuning into the Holy Spirit through prayer, through worship, through praise, through your Bible study. In that state, your spiritual antennas are high. They are on point. You can pick signals. So the word can come from somebody talking, or just like you said, some colleague was playing music, and God used the words there and spoke to you. The word can come by you. You're just in your bedroom taking a bath, and God speaks to you, and you know it's God speaking. The word can come with, oh, you just come back, you're eating and you're looking at a movie and something happens in the movie. And God uses that thing that happened in the movie to tell you something about what you've been asking him for. So the key to get here is number one, you must be spiritually sensitive. You're, you must be spiritually on point. Then number two, don't box God. God can communicate to you in a variety of ways. It's important you get this number two well, because if you don't, you go to a restaurant and everybody that is talking in the restaurant, you're, you're listening to know what God is telling you. God does not need to tell you through anybody. The funny thing is that that very song you listened to and God spoke to you through that song. You may listen to it again now. Nothing happens. God will not minister to you at all. It's just a normal song. Why? Because at that point in time, you were spiritually sensitive. And God just used that channel in his amazing dynamic way to just communicate something to you. He could have done it any other how. He could have done it by a dream. He could have done it with somebody. Some A friend of yours can just come in and say, ah, this, that, 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 and say something and then take off. It could have been anyhow. So the important thing is this. Once you're spiritually on point, you will pick it. And th that's the thing about God. When it's God speaking, because your spirit is alive, you will catch it that God is speaking. Every other person around you will not think anything about it, but you will know that is you that God spoke to. There's been a time you will sit down with a little boy. Oh, how are you? Yeah, how was school today? Fine. The little boy just opens his mouth and said, um, there's a contract that is coming. Ta -ta 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 -ta. You just say something that every other person that is around will think is careless or 
Little boy may say, ah, Mr. Peter, Mr. Peter, Mr. Peter will give you a gift, Mr. Peter, ha, 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 and then go and do another thing. The boy doesn't even know what he said. But because God was trying to communicate with you, that Mr. Peter, Mr. Peter becomes amplified in your spirit. And you know, oh, there is this contract I've been pursuing this Mr. Peter for. How did this boy know? He's not the boy. The boy is not important. The channel is not important. Don't go looking for small boys to tell you Mr. Peter. It's your spirit man that is important. Once your spirit man is alive, you can catch God speaking. You can catch God's signals. You can catch God's impressions from everywhere. From while you're sleeping in your dream, while you're in the toilet pooing, while you're baiting, while you're talking with people like in your case, while you're listening to a worship song or anyhow. Once that thing comes, you will know it's God that is speaking. And many times you just keep quiet. You just know God used this route to talk to me at this time and I've got to my answer. Many other times also it happens a lot in services, a lot. The pastor will be preaching. Many times people have come to me and say, Pastor, you just answered my, you answered a question I've been asking. Or some will come and say, Pastor, you were just preaching and your preaching was for me. It was like it was just me you were preaching to. And to be honest, for the life of you, I don't know. I, I, I just prepared a message, trusted the Holy Spirit to give me the inspiration prepared it, and came and preached it according to what I was led to preach. For somebody to say I was talking to him directly or to her directly, me, I don't know that one. That is how the Holy Spirit functions. The Holy Spirit just amplifies the words of the pastor in another person's heart in the congregation and answers the person's problem independent of the pastor. The pastor doesn't need to know because in that same service, there's somebody sleeping in the front seat. The same preaching that the pastor preached to that got somebody blessed. Another person was sleeping in the front seat. So it's not about, I'm, I'm trying to get, get you to understand the balance here. It's not about the channel. It's about you and the Holy Spirit. How in tune you are with the Holy Spirit. So that you can pick his impressions. You can pick his communications in the multitude of ways that they come. You may just come out in the morning, just in the morning to appreciate the morning sun. And God will talk to you there. It, it, it's amazing. Uh, you, if you read your Bible, God will come and talk to, the, to somebody and say, come to the potter's house. There's something I want to show you in the potter's house. And I'm asking myself a question. God, you spoke to the person in his room. You should have finished everything you wanted to say in the room now. Why call him out? Because he heard your voice in the room and still you're calling him out. Come here, let me tell you something. Sometimes God will say, come up to this mountain, let me speak to you. And I'm wondering, God, you spoke to him already. Why not just tell him everything? Why must you not tell him to climb him up? God is dynamic. And you will find out that when you now obey, you will see that that change of environment or that dynamic way God wants to communicate brings home the message in a much, much stronger way than it would ordinarily have come. So that's the key. The key is being in tune with the Holy Spirit. He can talk in many ways. Don't be fixated on who is talking behind me. Which music is playing? Are you sure that this music, God is not talking to me in the music? No, God will talk to you through your spirit. But your spirit can pick God's signals through any means. So that's just the point I wanted to make there. But thank you for that. That's, that's a very, a very powerful testimony and a very good question. Thank you for that, David. Okay, Pastor Stan, your hand is raised. All right. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um. There is something I want uh you said where you were talking about, you know, worship and you know, being in the mood of the spirit and thanksgiving, you know. Um you got to you got to reveal to me there is there was something the Holy Spirit taught me about this thing. You know, there's a time in one's life when you just you just come to a point, just like you you you, you said about Joseph, he was being bundled to Egypt and there is no way anyone would have convinced you that he knew that it was the plan of God that this process is going to take him to the palace, actually. You know? So, there are times in the life of a believer, when you just come to that point in life, you don't even know whether you're to go front or you're to go back or you're to go left or right. Mm. You're just stuck in between. You know, I've been, I've been, in, that, I've been in that situation. The Holy Spirit helped me. And what he taught me is, is something I want to share with us, especially in the in the area of thanksgiving, worship and praise. Mm. He was not telling me and said, 
that worship is actually what he, he was giving me instances in the scriptures that the 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 only sure means of getting down the glory of God as quick as possible, as fast as possible, is always in the place of worship, praises, and thanksgiving. Mm. That that's the place to get his presence fast. And he was not telling me and say, he gave me an instance in the book of Exodus where the Bible said that the the the, the glory cloud was was with the people of Israel by fire in the night mm. and, and as cloud by the day. He was not telling me and say, in that situation where you are you are so confused, you don't know what to do. It looks as if situations, everything is working against you. And you don't, you do, you don't, it seems like you do, you can't find your way out of that situation. That when you switch into worship, when you switch into praise, when you switch into thanksgiving, what you do is what you have to be sensitive of the glory cloud. Because mm -hmm. if you if you enter that mood of worship and enter that mood of praise, enter that mood of thanksgiving, and the cloud and the glory cloud comes, that wherever the direction of that glory cloud is actually the direction of the way out, that, that the direction of that glory cloud. Is, is actually the direction of the promised land. So he gave me that instance in the book of that. I said, watch, wherever that cloud is going, that is where the people went because that cloud is actually leading them to the place of destiny. It's actually leading them to the promised land. So when we worship and, and secure the glory, when the glory comes, whichever direction is going, that is actually the way out. Whichever direction that glory is going, that is actually where the destiny lies. Amen. This is just the little things I want to share, sir. Okay, but I want to ask you a question. How do you know the direction? Because you need to, you need, you need to clarify, you need to elaborate okay. further. Mm. Okay, when when the when the presence of God comes, you notice that when he when he when he came to Moses, you know there is God. God God always has something to say. God always has something to say. In the place of prayer, you could pray, you could pray and pray and pray and pray. You know, just like our pastor will always say. He said, when you pray, what happens is that God sends an angel. So when you worship and you, tense, and, and you enter thanksgiving and praise, what happens is that God, because of the fact that God cannot share his glory with anybody, he will come down himself. Mm. So the, the, the glory of God comes with a lot of things. Mm. He comes with a lot of things. He can come with discernment. Everything can come through that process. Mm. Amen. Okay, okay, because I needed you to land that, you needed to land that flight well. The point is this, when you worship and God comes, because each time you worship, you don't need to feel goose pimples or anything to know that God is there. Sometimes you may feel it. Sometimes you can sense the glory clouds, but you don't necessarily need to sense it. You just need to make sure that your heart is connected to what you're saying with your words, because the heart is always what God looks at. If you get the worship, thanksgiving, and gratitude and praise properly, by principle, God will be there. Now, you don't always get a, an instruction when he comes. You don't always get, you may feel the glory cloud. You don't always hear his voice or anything. But just know that there's something about God. Watch what he did with Paul and Silas. The moment he came, Paul and Silas didn't need to hear an instruction. Anything that was a barrier or problem melted. The chains were broken. Doors that imprisoned them opened. Then they walked out. So the point I'm trying to make is that the more of God's glory that you entertain, just remember the story of Obededom. Just that Obededom had the ark in his house. God did not give him a prophetic word. God did not give him visions or dreams. At least we didn't see it in the Bible. God did not give him a prophetic instruction. Just because the presence of God was in that house, the man prospered in three months. Simple. So the presence alone is a composite package. Whether you're giving a discernment or whether you're giving an instruction or whether you're giving a prophetic word, just hosting God, he looks around your life. What is not working? He sorts his out. How do we, yeah, we need to move this guy forward. We need to move this lady forward. He sorts his out. He doesn't need to make an announcement. You just find out that your life is moving from one level of glory to another. If it is divine direction now, he will now give it to you and you move. But the key is to continuously host his presence. And the way, just like Pastor Stanley, you said, the fastest and surest way to get God's presence in your life is an atmosphere of praise, thanksgiving, 
worship, gratitude. And that's it. That's it. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Any other input so that we can... Um... Okay, Pastor Emma. Okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening, yeah, everyone. Good evening. Um, yeah. I, I'm just trying to marry everything together. I would, you know, there was a time in, in this place that your emphasis was on prayer mm. and praying long. Mm. So I was not acting the Holy Spirit. He said, yes, it's, it's, a all continu it's a continuation of that. Yes. I noticed that, like you said, when God teaches you, you come and teach us. Mm. And now, so it is this thing now, it's not a contradicting what you mm. said. So it's, it's a continuous thing because mm. anybody that can't pray long cannot also worship long. Very true. So, Very so, true. So, so we need to know that these are continuation. Of um of your dealings with God, and then you are teaching us these things, so that um so that one this is not to endamine power of prayer. If you can't pray well, you can't worship well. Worship is not just the song. You know, somebody was preaching and listened to him. He said the greatest book of prayer is actually the Psalms, mm. the book of Psalm. Nobody prayed and praised like David. Mm. That's why at every point in time, God is dealing with that man. At every point in anything, like you said, anything he is dealing with, he has put it in a song, he has put it in words. He talks to God as if he's his lover. Mm. His prayer, you need to listen, read the book of Psalm. It looks like he's talking, his prayer, his song, all of them are interwoven together. Mm. Now, I also want to say something about worship. We, like we always say, we can pray our miss, but we cannot worship our miss. Yeah. Now, what worship does most times is to change our attitude towards the situation. Because sometimes what we do as prayer is actually complaining. Oh God, you need to help me. Oh God, when will you, you know? And we are spend, spending hours praying in quotes and it's complaining. But when we switch the prayer to actually worship, it, it, it helps to frame our attitude towards the problem. At that point, you are not seeing the problem. You are seeing the bigness of God. How mighty God. And you are expressing it with your word. At this point, you are not talking about the problem. You are talking about how big God is. As you are seeing that, that's worship. The situations become small. God becomes big. So mm -hmm. I think that is what worship actually does. And so when we do that, God will now say, who is this person that is doing this, that is giving this kind of... An angel cannot come and receive God's praise. That's why God comes down to receive his praise. That's why we say when we worship, God comes. So it is important that we know that these things are interwoven. We pray, we worship, we spend, and then worship is not necessarily about the song. No, it's, worship is not a slow song. Mm -hmm. Praise is not a, a fast song, because that's what we think. Praise is a fast song. Worship is a slow song. No, that's, they are, they are not, they are, that's not it. it. There must not be a beat. Praise talks about what God has done. You are thanking him for what he has done. Worship, you are thanking God for who he is. So all of them are interwoven. It makes God bigger than the issue that we have. You know, we have a lot of problems. Sometimes we come to the place of prayer, we are, we are bamboozled with our issues. But so what we are teaching us now is forget about our issues and focus on the bigness of this God. That's exactly what worship does. And when we do that, that's when God shows up and sorts out whatever is in our life. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that. Let me let me let me say something in that regard as well, because it's also there's something called the heart of worship. I remember I think there was there's a particular song I think it's uh, Michael W Smith or something like that that sang it. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Lord is all about you. That thing he's saying is an important point to note because I found out that. With a lot of praise and a lot of worship songs around, people are more into vibing with the beat, vibing with the rhythm. Ah, this particular worship, you know, dance and dance and dance, vibing with the beat and the rhythm. And <laughs> the praise is not there. The worship is not there. The Christians are just enjoying the party-like vibe because they are not really able to go to club. So there are some particular gospel ministers that know how to give danceable praise. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that in all the vibe, don't forget the heart of the worship. It's all about God. You have to, you have to know what you're saying. And what you're saying has to be God-focused, testimony-focused, glorifying God. 
So there are a couple of songs that we see in churches and they sing and they call it praise songs. And when I hear it, I say, I don't see where God is being praised. For example, um, there's this one that we say. <laughs> there's this one that we say, Iye kele kele, ah, Iye kele kele. And people are clapping, you know, you turn and clap to the lapers. Jesus, sile, Jesus, sile, Jesus, sile. There is no pot that would... <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying, let's just check all the praise songs. Um, there are some songs when you hear it, you know it's not God being praised. I give another example. But these songs are not necessarily bad. They are what we call believers' motivational songs. They motivate believers, but they don't praise God. I rather want to praise God, but that's me. I'm not saying the believers' motivation is bad. I give another example. I'm walking in power. I'm walking in miracles. I live a life of favor. I know who I am. Who is being praised? And who is being praised? You're just boasting in a sense. But it's good Christian boast. It's not bad. It's what we call affirmations. It's positive affirmation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God is not being praised, actually. So I'm saying this because we need to get back to the heart of worship. God looks at the heart. The heart of worship is that, Lord, I appreciate you. I reverence you. I'm grateful to you. There is no one like you. You are an amazing God. It's centered on Christ. It's centered on the Holy Spirit. It's centered on God. If it is not centered on God, you're not praising God. You're being entertained. Not that it's bad, but if you have a whole praise session in church doing believers' motivation, God was not praised. God, you guys just enjoyed yourself dancing. Oh, and people are, you know, dancing, dancing. Jesus, Jesus. It's not bad, but <laughs> my head, my shoulders, my knees, my toes, my head. I, 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 maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see God praise. <laughs> but anyway, 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 those are believers' motivation songs. They're not, they are not bad, but it's just that if you spend all the time singing those kind of songs without actually glorifying God, I wonder about it. I wonder about it. I, I would say for myself, the people were motivated. You know how motivational speakers are? They were motivated. They were gingered, but I didn't quite see God praised. I didn't quite see God, God glorified. So in that whole praise session, God may not inhabit it at all. Maybe the person who now leads worship may now bring down the glory of God. Anyway, so why am I saying this? I'm saying it for us to remember. It's the heart of worship that is what God looks at. God always looks at the heart. He never bothers with external countenance. He wants to know, do you really mean this thing you're saying? And he will know. Do you really love me? Do you really appreciate me? Is this thing you're saying with your lips? Have you not read the Bible where God says their lips are speaking certain things, but their heart is far from me? There was a particular king God talked about. He did the right things in the sight of God, but with a wrong heart. And because of that, he was disqualified. So let's let's... Let's, as we are talking about prayer, like, like I said, nothing here is contradictory. It's a full continuum. The prayer, all I'm just doing now is I'm still emphasizing long prayer times, following all our prayer watches. I still emphasize that because prayer is extremely important. I'm just saying, let us raise our praise and worship as well. Not do 10 minutes praise and worship or do five minutes praise and worship as a prelude to pray and then pray for two hours. Let's also extend our praise and worship times because God inhabits the praises of his people. Okay, somebody wrote on the chat. Thank you so much, Pastor. I had a prophetic word from Pastor Emma during the refreshing hour in Sharjah last week concerning a heart issue that God is working on. And thank you for enlightening all on that, for being in line with what God said to come to pass through prayers, praise and thanksgiving. Okay, so thank you for that. So I think we can sign out for now. Um, um, so 
remember the key is in the practice you don't don't think you know it that you heard it it's in the practice that you you really get to move it into your spirit man and it becomes like a working system for you that delivers results to you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for staying up until now. Remember to keep a date with us next week, Tuesday, 9 p.m. UAE time. Invite as many people as you can. Let's all come together and grow in God together and be blessed on account of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now forevermore. Amen. And surely, may God's goodness and his mercies keep amen. following us all the days of our lives as we dwell in this house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless you all and see you again next time. Thank you, sir.